So uh, over the last uh, few days, uh, uh, Bernie, we've had some wonderful conversations. But one thing we didn't talk about is what we're going to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> right. So uh, we're going to wing it a little bit and uh, start a conversation and then uh, invite, invite you to join in, of course. Um, I was just thinking, though, uh, uh, well, first of all, of course, I want to thank you for the masterly way of teaching you have and the, uh, the way you, you introduce uh, people of all uh, levels of knowledge into this mystical, the joys, uh, the delight of this mystical wisdom that's so important for our time. It reminded me of my, when I was a little boy, I forced my, persuaded my brother, my older brother, to teach me to swim. And uh, he was, didn't want to be bothered with me, but he took me to the swimming pool, and uh, his method was to push me in at the deep end. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I, or I can still remember sinking to the bottom and then learning to swim just as a matter of survival. Uh, and I think your, your uh, gift is, is, to, uh, is to push us in at the deep end without speaking down to us mm -hmm. or in any way being condescending or oversimplistic, but at the same time making it uh, feel possible for, for, for people to swim in this, in this great wisdom. So maybe the first thing I'd like to raise with you as a topic is something that came up yesterday, I forget who it was, uh, the question of the, the word meditation. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you said uh, that, of course, the word meditation covers a broad spectrum of uh, meaning and different practices. Uh, I think that's, that's vital, and one can use it in a more specific way as we do, but we need to remember it has that wider mm -hmm. meaning as well. But, uh, in the way that we use, of course, the word meditation, John Main chose that word to describe what we teach and what he found in John Cassian, mm -hmm. uh, simply because it was the word that uh, meant that to the great majority of people. Mm -hmm. Most people on the street today think of meditation more in terms of this apophatic laying aside of thoughts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is it, I think it's uh, Evagrius describes prayer as the laying aside of thoughts. Yes, yeah. uh, more people think of it like that than they do of it as lexio or as uh, mm -hmm. a more discursive kind of meditation. So I was wondering whether you, how, how, if you could say something about that specific, well, that specific uh, uh, aspect of the meaning of meditation in which Cassian says, we abandon or renounce all the riches of thought and imagination and come with ready ease, well, this is the old translation, we come with ready ease to the first of the Beatitudes, to poverty of spirit. Mm -hmm. um, so so how, 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 you, what you, how you pick up on that and how you see it resonating with other traditions. And if I could just, just add one other aspect to that, this question or this point. Cassian uh, is writing the Tenth Conference, which I think many or most of the people here will be aware of. He's writing that in a quite a controversial environment over the orig originist uh, yeah. controversy. And he leaves out some of the details of that, that, he, that they lost the debate. And, yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and he emphasizes very strongly for that reason that he was on this side of the argument. He emphasizes very strongly, as you mentioned the other day, that this was a tradition that was taught by the oldest of the mm -hmm. Desert Fathers yeah. who themselves learnt it from the Apostolic Fathers. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I think many of the people here who uh, sharing in the work of our community and teaching meditation will have found that on occasions. Mm. They will find that teaching prayer in this way, rather as you were describing through Meister Eckhart today, uh, not petitionary prayer and so on, that that is controversial 
or it is confusing or it is uh, antagonizing to, to some people, mm -hmm. uh, just as it was at you know, the end of the fourth century. Uh, that seems to me to say something about the perennial nature of the mystical yeah. tradition in the church, but could you, could yeah. you comment on that? Well, I could say that uh, by starting with where, at your last point, I mean, there is a certain sense in which meditation is natural, I think, to human nature. But that doesn't mean that we cannot learn how to use the natural capacity. So I think the idea of teaching meditation is, is crucial. And it's not that you're giving people something they didn't have the capacity for, but you're helping them to develop that, that capacity. And that's why I think meditation is very important as part of a, a teaching tradition. And uh, for me, it is a broadly capacious word that would include both the positive and the negative aspects, both the, the cataphatic and, uh, and the apophatic. Uh, uh, and the way in which the monks, uh, such as um, the people I was talking about uh, you know, the other day, Guigo and the others, I mean, met, you work at meditation. You're working at it, you're putting in effort, and you're doing positive things trying to understand a particular uh, scriptural text. But that should be moving you on to a level, a new level of insight, which may not need images and uh, as much thinking as you approach the level of what he calls contemplatio, as you ap uh, approach this level of simplification. The, the real uh, process here is, I think, the process of, of simplification. You have to start out with effort and complex ideas and using different scriptures, but you're moving towards the greater simplicity in which a, a single thought or a single idea will encompass so many others. So you, <clears throat> you're moving in the direction of the apophatic. You're moving in the direction of uh, a silence and a stilling. That, I think, is still a part of the meditative process but that the, uh, the monks I was talking about the other day would say is also the beginning of contemplation mm. in, in the sense that uh, you're, you're becoming less and less complex and you're becoming more and more unified mm. around particular insights that themselves become more and more simplified as they approach the, the divine nature. And I'd make one, one, one further comment on, on your initial story about being pushed into the deep end. Mm. <laughs> and learning how to swim. Uh, let me use an image that first occurs in Gregory the Great. Gregory the Great, uh, and I would apply it also to mysticism, Gregory the Great is applying it to scripture and the infinite capacity, the wonderful capacity of scripture to appeal both to the simple and to the complex. And he says that scripture is a broad river in which lambs may wade and elephants may swim. <laughs> <laughs> lambs may wade, that is the simple will get enough out of scripture and they can keep their feet on the ground, but it also is so wonderful and so rich and so deep that the elephants can swim in it. Mm. And I'd like to think that the mystical tradition has that, has that aspect too. Many of these thinkers are, are, are very, very difficult and uh, they're all, I think, very profound, but they also can give us solid, simple truths for the lambs mm -hmm. so that the lambs can start to wade and eventually transform themselves into elephants <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and swim around in the depths of the mystical tradition. So Castian, Castian also says, I think you also quoted this, that one of the way, he said, when we first began to pray in this way that Abbot Isaac told us, uh, we thought, ah, oh, this is going to help us keep our minds focused because we, were very, we felt very distracted and that worried us. And they almost felt that the state of distraction was like original sin. They yeah. couldn't, sh couldn't get rid of it. So uh, we, they were very happy to hear about the formula, the, the repetition of yeah. focusing the mind in this way. Uh, but, and then he said, then we discovered it was much more difficult than we had thought it was going to be. <laughs> and then the next thing he says is, is um, but we realized fairly quickly that uh, it was changing. Well, he, didn't say, he doesn't say this, but he said it was changing us. And the first way he seemed to recognize us was 
in the way he read the scriptures. Mm -hmm. And he, he now said, we, we read, he now says, we, we, read, we read them as if we were the author of them, yeah. and we could see into the very bones and marrow yes, of the scripture. Exactly. Yeah. So, uh, this, this uh, kind of to and fro, really, between mm -hmm. the, uh, almost between the two hemispheres of the brain, or the, the cataphatic and the apophatic, mm -hmm. the way you know that you're growing in this apophatic way, even though it may be very difficult, is that you are, for example, able to read scripture in a new way. In, in a, in a, new, in a way. new way, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. No, I, I think distractions uh, are, are a part of the mystical path uh, and a part of the prayer path. I mean, Teresa of Avila is really wonderful on this, particularly if you read her life, because she tells us, and also it's in the, it's in the interior castle as well, she tells us how distracted she was. She had a mind that seemed to lend itself to distraction mm. as she talks about herself. And so it was a very long learning process. And of course, it was the work of grace that enabled her finally to be able to concentrate her attentions. Um, but she testifies to how difficult that was <coughs> and how even when she was a very experienced prayer, that there was still you know, the imagination would flit around with all sorts of images, and uh, this continued to trouble her, but she finally learned to accept that that had its place in the whole process by which she learned eventually to arrive at the prayer of quiet, the prayer of union, uh, etc. So, uh, they're, they're, distractions in prayer are troubling, mm. but I think they're part of the prayer life itself. It's like the Desert Fathers would say, you know, you're struggling until the end of your life, but if you didn't have the struggle, you wouldn't be growing. Yes, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. If, if you could spend a weekend either, you could not with both, <laughs> but you had to choose between uh, Teresa or John of the Cross, who would you choose to spend it with? <laughs> <laughs> I think I'd choose Teresa. <laughs> 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 And, you know, Teresa and John were very closely, were very close friends, but she made fun of him because she said he was too serious. Mm -hmm. And uh, she, uh, several places in her writings, then once there's this little writing where uh, uh, she uh, uh, talked about a particular, uh, you know, relationship between prayer of union and prayer of quiet, and she sent a letter to somebody, and she wasn't there, so a number of, of her friends met, 10 or 12 of her friends met and wrote out responses to this issue and they sent them to Teresa. And John wrote this very complicated theological one, and she said that, uh, thank you, Father John, for giving an answer to a question I didn't ask. <laughs> <laughs> isn't, there, there's a, isn't there a description of uh, John of the Cross being the life and soul of the party at some uh, picnic? You remember that? Well, there's something about his love for asparagus somewhere, <laughs> which I think I remember. <laughs> What do you think of this? I, I mean, uh, John, as you read John of the Cross, uh, and, and as you read uh, about his life, he was a marvelous spiritual director. He was an extremely kind person, but he was also very serious, uh, a very serious person. It didn't prevent him from being such a, you know, a, an amazing spiritual director. And don't forget, John's writings that we have are basically the fruit of his uh, advisees, mostly among sisters, who were reading his poetry. Poetry begins composing in prison. Then he brings out the poetry, uh, deeply spiritual, and he's reading it to mostly sisters, also to some of the friars, and explaining it, and they're still having difficulty <coughs> understanding it. So they ask him, can't you write out in prose you know, some explanations that will help us, especially if we don't have, have you there? And so that's the reason we have these four great treatises, they're really three, but uh, one splits into two. We have these four great mystical treatises that, con that really form a kind of summa of the mystical life. But at the beginning of those, particularly the beginning of the spiritual canticle, he says, this is just one explanation of the poetry. It's not the definitive one. Uh, and he wrote the poetry. But of course, the poetry is also a gift from God. It's given him. And he recognizes that no prose explanations, even his own, can ever exhaust the fullness uh, that's uh, been given him in grace, 
that he then tried to express in the poetry. So you've got a kind of three-stage process here from the inner experience that he had in prison, which was both horrible torture, but also this amazing consolation given him by God. Then he felt he had to express it, so he writes, out, he writes it out in, in these wonderful poems. And then he takes the poems with him in a little book, we're told, when he escapes. Then he begins teaching the poems, and then the sons say, well, you know, try to explain it further to us. Mm. Uh, so I, I think that's an important uh, aspect of the kind of, um, first of all, process, and then the open-endedness of the great mystics, and John of the Cross would be a perfect mm. example of and, that. And his poetry is, is I didn't, hadn't, didn't realize this until quite recently, that his poetry is regarded as, you know, <coughs> part of the, the great poetry of the Spanish literary tradition, not only the religious or spiritual. Right, and, and, spiritual and, and the world. I, I and, and, and the world, world yeah. And that's, of course, also interesting. Um, the poetry is very popular in his own lifetime, but then for several centuries, it's the prose works that are, <coughs> that are really read. And the rediscovery of John's poetry is another late 19th century, 20th century phenomenon. Mm. And uh, all to the good, of course. So now we can take the poetry and the prose and feed them off against each other. Both sides are necessary for fully understanding John. Just as in the case with Meister Eckhart that I talked about, Eckhart is the first major mystical theologian who writes both in the technical learned language of the schools in Latin, but also preaches in the new vernacular, the Middle High German. And some Eckhart scholars would say, oh, it's the German Eckhart, you know, because it's so creative, the language and the Latin is dead. No, you really have to understand Eckhart by looking at both the Latin works and the Middle High German works and seeing how they interact, even though the Middle High German sermons may be much more lively in a certain sense. The theological meat of these is often expressed in the, in the Latin treatises. So you need both the Latin and the German. In case of John of the Cross, you need both the poetry and the long prose commentaries. Do you, do you think the, uh, the writing, uh, the expression of mystical theology has got more complex over the centuries uh, because of, I don't know, our, our, you know the, the growth of human knowledge uh, through science and, and intercultural encounters? Uh, if you take something like in the desert uh, tradition, the uh, theme of Achadia, that's, uh, that speaks, I think, to, to everyone who, who has any kind of spiritual practice and who's le learning to meditate, that you go through a cycle, cycles of, of dryness and uh, uh, impatience with oneself or uh, irritability and, uh, you know, you want to give it up and do something else. So, uh, but there's a fair, it's a fairly simple description of that cycle uh, from Achadia to Apatheia to Agape, and then mm -hmm. almost the cycle begins again. There's progress, but there's a cycle of progress. Mm -hmm. But then with John of the Cross, you have the Dark Knight, yeah. which is actually not a... I mean, I, I, I recommend the dark, that treatise on the Dark Knight for anyone who's feeling depressed, yes. yeah. because it cheers you up. It, it, and it, it, don't you find? <laughs> it also tells you the difference between depression and the dark night. Because yes. mm -hmm. many people, I mean, there are certain, you might say, psychological similarities mm -hmm. between the two. But if you read it very carefully, you'll see that some of it may look like depression, but it's not. It has another aspect to it that could be the aspect that cheers you up in that <laughs> sense because you recognize it. Because you that, know what it, that yeah. it has some purpose. Yes, it, yeah. it, has, it has a purpose. It's within the context of a wider picture. Um, does mystical literature and mystical discourse get more complicated? I don't really think so, because I think uh, mystical literature or mystical discourse, uh, whatever, however we want to frame it, is a lot more like art and poetry than it is like science. Mm. And science has a definite progression. I mean, our moderns, great as Newton was, mm. we know a lot more about the universe than Newton knew. Mm. 
and in another 50 years, people will know a lot more about the universe than we know today. So there's a def definite curve within, within science that I don't think exists in, uh, if you will, in the humanities and the religious humanities. Uh, that is a, an artistic masterpiece, like take Homer or Virgil, mm -hmm. it, is still a masterpiece, although our world is much more uh, complicated. And um, very few mystical works ha have more complexity and depth to them than these Dionysian writings, yes, for right. example, yeah. or than Meister, uh, Meister Eckhart. We do have contemporary figures who make use of those themes. They'll use them in a new way because our context is a new context. The point I was making uh, the other day about we can't just repeat the past, but we take things from the past, we take aspects, we take themes out of this literature and try to use them as we express the same or similar truths within a new context. So we have to use the world in which we're, in which we're living and we have to address that world, but I, I don't think that we're necessarily, you know, getting more complicated about it or taking it to a new level of profundity. Because the level of profundity with mystical discourse doesn't have a bottom. <laughs> and so, no matter how deep you go, you're still infinitely separated from the divine infinity. That's a great uh, mystical theme that Gregory of Nyssa first makes explicit. They, it's called epectasis, constantly stretching forward mm -hmm. towards the infinite God. And finding f great fruition and joy in that constant stretching out, but also realizing a kind of frustration because there's still an infinite direction, it's still an infinite distance to go. <clears throat> and for Gregory of Nyssa and others, that's going to be as true in heaven as it is here. Yes. So the, the, and it's based on a text in Paul, Philippians uh, 3.13, you know, constantly stretching out to God. And although Gregory is the first to make it, as I said, in an explicit way, most mystical writers, even before Gregory and certainly after Gregory, even though they don't use the same word in the same categories, they have the same thing. It's an endless journey that's both infinitely rewarding and yet keeps you on the move because there's more to go. So it just keeps getting better and better, like your lectures. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't given the last one yet, so be careful. It might be a bomb. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what do you think about uh, the, I, I think I mentioned to you uh, the other day uh, a conversation I had with Raymond Panica, oh, my old he's friend. a great uh, old friend yeah, of yours yeah, and a yeah. uh, great uh, <laughs> Spanish-Indian uh, theologian and contemplative and scholar, a great and amazing scholar. Um, he used to say, you know, if somebody would introduce him as being half Spanish and half Indian, he would say, no, I'm 100% Spanish and 100% Indian. <laughs> um, but uh, towards the end of his life, uh, well, no, actually not towards the end of his life, when he was in his full glory, I, I asked him, uh, did you ever, I think he was never, he was never challenged by Rome, uh, because I don't, think, I don't think anyone dared to, <laughs> to, to challenge him intellectually. But I asked him, do you, uh, were you ever, did you ever feel that your intelligence got in the way of your, your own contemplative practice? And uh, he, he, divided, he, he sort of didn't have an academic career because he mm -hmm. spent six months teaching and six months, uh, I don't know, in ashrams or living in India. So uh, he chose to live his life in that way. So I asked him, did your intelligence ever get in the way of your contemplative practice? And he said, no. <laughs> I'm too intelligent to allow that to happen. <laughs> <laughs> so would you say the same about yourself? <laughs> I can't use the same line, though. I mean, it's <laughs> But I, I believe in the truth of it. Uh, Panikar was a wonderful representative, of course, of someone who lived two traditions. Mm. I mean, he was a Catholic, but he came out of a Hindu tradition. And the interaction between his connection, he wasn't, he wasn't bi-religious. You know, if you asked him, he's a Catholic Christian. But his Catholic Christianity was deeply influenced 
by his Hindu background. Mm. And he, his, the meditations that he practiced was very much influenced by Hindu practices, uh, et cetera. He was a truly you know, ecumenical figure in that sense, uh, in terms of his own uh, personality. And uh, you were cousins. My uh, dear friend was also a very good friend, a, a closer friend to, to Panikkar than I ever was. And I always thought you were cousins was the one who introduced the term global spirituality, hmm. that we live in an era of global spirituality, even though we might belong to particular traditions, be they Christian or Hindu or Jewish or, or Muslim. Uh, and uh, you know, the recognition of that global situation in which we live religiously, a, religion, a, a place of global spirituality, seems to me to be of vital importance for where we're going in the 21st century. And I've always wondered if, if Ewart kind of uh, created that term as a reflection of his conversations with, oh, yes. with Raman Panikkar. Makes sense. Yes. Yeah, it would make sense. Yeah. Because Panikkar was a, a global person with his knowledge of spiritual traditions, his working to bring these traditions together, his insights into how that might uh, happen or not happen. You didn't have to always agree with him. There are a lot of things that Panikkar used, and I used to argue about. Mm -hmm. But that was his intention. That where he, that's mm -hmm. where he was moving. And I think that's a very important uh, paragon, image, uh, model for where it has to go today. Sure. Yes. A question that uh, is often uh, asked, uh, and I think it reflects even, even the trouble that uh, Meister Eckhart had with, with the Pope uh, on that question of the nature of prayer, is, which is where, when the, the balance between those, those, uh, those elements, those three elements of religion, uh, is lost, mm. then the institutional, for example, becomes repressive of the, uh, yep. of the contemplative. And that creates, you know, generally a dysfunctional personality in the church. But it's very strong, and it can, it can lead to a lot of, a lot of anger and a lot of, a lot of pain and suffering. But so, uh, so a question that sort of addresses that, which is the question of the 21st century, really, is it's often raised: is, is it the same experience with, with if a Buddhist meditates or a, uh, a Christian or a Jew or a Sufi or a Hindu? Is it, is it the same experience? Are they going to the same place? Or, mm -hmm. And it seems to me, uh, be interested to know your response to this, that we have to say ultimately, if, from a Christian point of view, we believe there is one God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yes, we do go to the same place. That's quite disturbing, I think, for some yeah. uh, institutional mentalities. Yeah because it means we don't have the monopoly or we don't, yeah. we're not controlling access to this experience. But then, so I, I personally, I, that's what I, I, how I would say, yes, we must go to the same place or as one God. And that also explains why people sharing a contemplative orientation and practice across different traditions yeah. can get on can get much on better so well. with each other than they can with yeah people of a more repressive or orientation uh, in, their own, in their own faith tradition. So, I don't know if, if, you would, if you would resonate with that. And then, how would you describe the difference then? Where the difference must come in interpretation and language, um, how we describe this experience, what it means to us, how we I don't know, incarnate it and yeah. support it in daily life and the kind of community we're living in, all of that. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Well, one of the most difficult questions, uh, theoretical questions about mysticism over the last 50 or 60 years has been, you know, whether it, what's called sometimes the essentialist position, that all mystical experience is ultimately one, or the alternate camp, and this is conducted mostly among philosophers, a kind of constructivist position, that the different mysticisms are constructed within different religious and, and social uh, contexts, and that really are, are different. That debate has gone on and on and, and on. Uh, 
my own take on that would be a variation on, Lawrence, what you just, uh, just said. Uh, I think we all are aiming in the same direction. Uh, we all are aiming towards the same goal, but we're taking different directions that are historically conditioned by the faith traditions in which we live. That goal, however, is an eschatological goal. Mm. It ain't here yet. <laughs> mm. So that when we do, when the different traditions have different experiences of God, moments of consciousness, these are very much conditioned by the faith and historical situations in which they are. But I think an argument can be made, um, theologically and perhaps even philosophically, that the goal intended in the long range, in the eschaton, is one and the same goal. Mm. So I don't see it as actually happening here. I think there are too many differences among the moments. And no, but there's great yeah. similarities in terms of practice and in terms yeah. of certain values. And fruits, by the fruits, fruits, you will know them. Exactly, mm. but I hesitate to say, oh, it's all the same. Yeah. That's the crude essentialist position. Yeah. All the mystics are experiencing the same thing. They just explain it in different ways. I think that's far too simplistic. But the total constructivist position is also incorrect. Mm. You know, that they're all totally, it, it's what, you know, it, it, it's basically what in the Middle Ages used to be called nominalism. Mm. You know, everything is just a name. There's no real unity. But the unity, if it does exist, and I believe it does, is the unity of an eschatological goal of all, of all the religions. So we've got to wait. Well, and you have to, we have to keep the two, two arguments balanced in a way because... The Dalai Lama says, on occasions, my religion is kindness. Yeah. You can't argue with that. Yes. <laughs> you know? And he says, if your religion doesn't make you a nicer person, then there's something wrong with yeah, you yeah. or the religion. And then, on the other hand, on another occasion, he will say, uh, I think Buddhism is the best religion for me. Yeah. Okay. And that is also quite disturbing, I think, to a certain kind of... Yeah. of religious mind, because it seems to subject, subject certainly to a Christian, yeah. sort of a certain type of Christian uh, evangelical mind, perhaps, because uh, it seems too subjective and, and or rel relativistic. Um, but in another way, it can't be denied, because most people, maybe this is changing in a secularized society, but most people follow a religious tradition uh, that is compatible with the culture they're born in. Yes. Yep. Isn't it? Yep. And even if like, Buddhism is, uh, is brought into, the, into Western or Californian culture, yep. it, becomes, uh, <laughs> it, it becomes Californian yeah. after a while, doesn't it? Yes, yeah. So it's very, very different. You know, Thai, Thai, Thai Buddhism is very different in... Yeah. So, um, mm. we presume, as there is a cultural evolution taking place, and our global, unless everything shuts down and we no longer have the internet and we no longer have <laughs> travel, uh, this globalization of culture uh, or familiarity of culture and interaction at a, at a faster and faster rate is happening. Yeah. It's accelerating change. Where do you see that leading in yeah. terms of a mystical, yeah. common mystical culture? Yeah. I'm not sure it's leading to a common mystical culture. When I use the phrase global Christianity or global spirituality, global spirituality, it would be the recognition of the fact that today religions, religious traditions know more about each other than they ever had in the past. They're trying to overcome the hatreds and the tensions of the past with great difficulty as we see on the level of the, uh, of the fundamentalisms. For me, ecumenism involves primarily a respect for the integrity of another tradition mm. and the mutual respect that traditions should have among themselves. And that, that's, that's occurring. It's difficult, but it is occurring. It's certainly greater now than it was 50 years ago or 100 years ago, and let alone 500 uh, years yeah. ago in most, uh, in most yeah. cases. Yeah. So what, what needs to take that sense of the integrity of another religion and try not to colonize any other religious tradition. I mean, for all that I like uh, Karl Rahner very much, uh, 
You know, the no Rahner's notion of the anonymous Christian mm. can be insulting to people who aren't Christians. Yeah, or hidden. <laughs> yeah, or, you know, a uh, Jewish scholar might say, I don't want to be an anonymous mm. Christian. I want to be a good Jew. Yeah, or, or <laughs> and they'd, they'd, have, they'd have every right, you know, to make that point. In other words, uh, the, the mutual understanding and attempt to uh, collaborate with others doesn't mean that you have to agree on everything, mm. but it means you have to agree to work together insofar as you can and respect the real differences. And those differences, I think, exist within the, among the mystical traditions uh, as well, but we have to keep talking yeah. and we have to keep working towards greater mutual cooperation and, and respect for each other. So is there a common mysticism in the future? I don't see it, and would it be good even? I'm not sure. Well, <laughs> not a common religion, maybe. Uh, but, yeah. but I mean, Panikkar changed the title of one of his books, didn't he? The Hidden Christ of Hinduism. Yeah. He changed, he changed the title later on, yeah. or rewrote it, I think. Yes. Yeah. But uh, I wonder whether the ecumenism is just about respect. What, what I've learned from uh, the interreligious dialogue that I've done, and when we do it uh, in the community, we, we always incorporate. Uh, you know, a common meditation period yeah. into the, the time of dialogue, which I find changes the chemistry, the mood, and the way you relate to the, to the people you're talking with and dialoguing with. But so is it just about, and, and when, that, when you do that, I think it's more than just being respectful of the other person, the integrity of the other person's tradition you are actually pushed towards the point where you try or you're willing to see reality from the other person's point of view. Yeah. And that's quite, that can be quite scary mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because if you can see from another person's point of view, how do you know when you come back to your own point of view that you will right, still be yeah, holding yeah, it? Yeah. No, I, I fully agree with that and that's a nice extension of uh, you know, my, my first point about mutual respect, there is a further dimension. Mm. And the further dimension is to try as far as possible to get in the other person's shoes yeah. and see why they believe and act the way they do. And I, I just had one uh, uh, addendum to that too. It's much easier to share practices, particularly practices like meditation with other religious traditions that have a similar uh, have a similar dynamic and a similar kind of practical side. My friend Basil Pennington, now deceased, who is one of the pioneers, as many of you know, of centering prayer. Uh, Basil not only spent time as a Western monk on Mount Athos with the Eastern monks, but he also spent time in India living with Hindu uh, monks. And he wrote little books on both of those practices. And he, he once told me that when he first went to live with Indian monks, it was a very strange world, but as they went into meditation and their meditation practices, he felt completely at home. Yes. So it was the practical side of, the, of monastic meditation mm. where Basil felt, yes, I, I, I belong here in a way. Mm. And so the practical, orthopraxis or praxis, mm. is, uh, is in a certain sense at least as important as, as trying to talk about our different beliefs, orthodoxies, ortho, ortho orthodoxy and its various yeah, yeah. manifestations. Great. Just before we open up to, to other people's uh, questions or comments, uh, I, I don't know if, if you came across uh, the, the work of a British uh, neurologist and psychiatrist called Ian McGilchrist. I have not. He's written a very long, interesting book. It took him 20 years, actually, as Rowan Williams uh, introduced me to. Uh, and it's a synthesis of the uh, work that's been done in the last 20 years on uh, discovering how the two hemispheres of the brain work. Mm -hmm. And he's, he's not a religious person at all. He's not anti-religious, but he's not religious. And uh, he came to speak at our center recently because I think what he's saying actually is very, offers a very interesting commentary or metaphor, you know, through science. Science, I think, offers metaphors for us um, of some ancient wisdom. And basically, he's you know, describing how the two hemispheres of the brain work together, contemplation and action, as you were talking about the other day, or Martha and Mary, or the apophatic and the cataphatic. Uh, 
that he says the two hemispheres of the brain work uh, together in all the, all the major functions of consciousness, but there is a world of difference between them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And not only that, but that the right hemisphere, which is the contemplative, we would say, uh, the Mary dimension, uh, has priority. You know, Mary has chosen the better part, <laughs> Jesus says. So uh, I wonder whether you, how you feel, I don't, obviously science can't and, and, and shouldn't try to explain or uh, justify uh, mystical wisdom. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. On the other hand, as you were saying, modern science is getting closer and closer to some of the language and intuitions of mystical traditions, yep. the idea of relationship, uh, uh, overcoming of duality, the idea of union, uh, and so on. So these, uh, do you see this as, I'm sure, uh, do you see this as, as offering us proof or simply that the distance between science and religion or these two hemispheres of the brain is decreasing in some way? I guess it depends on the scientists. Because there are some scientists who are still very strongly opposed to religion, yeah. who think of it as, uh, as superstition. There are other scientists who recognize that science itself is, is a progression, it it's, has its limitations, it has its fuzzinesses, and who talk almost as if they're mystics mm. when they begin talking about the deepest truths of, with regard to the universe, that they may not be able to prove scientifically, but they're kind of intuitions. Mm that they've been, uh, have been led to. So I see certain scientists, and there's big literature on this, Brian Swim and other people like that who've written about the relationship. Ken, Ken Wilburn. And Ken Wilburn and various others. It's not something I read uh, very widely in myself, but I, I keep, try to keep abreast of what they're talking about. And, and there is a sense with those scientists who are very adventurous thinkers, yes. who begin to talk in language that sounds very similar to mysticism, and that is often open to the deepest riches in the uh, you know in in the contemplative tradition, but they're not all not no, all the scientists no talk like that. There well, are certain very famous scientists and legitimately famous scientists who I think have blinkers with, when it comes to anything anything religious. Unfortunate blinkers, but they're there. Mm. Um, Wilbur uh, claims that all the great scientists of the 20th century ended up with a mystical view of the universe. And he wrote a. For, put together an anthology of, yep. of that to illustrate that. 